So we are reading through the gospel of Matthew. It's his biography of Jesus' life. He was one of the 12 disciples, and he was going through his life, just living life. He's a tax collector, and one day Jesus walked up to his table and said, follow me. And, and Matthew left everything to follow Jesus, and he, he wrote down all of these moments in Jesus' life, and, and the moment we're in, he's, he's writing down something called the Sermon on the Mount, the greatest sermon ever preached by the greatest teacher who ever taught, and Jesus talking about what it means to live a life in the kingdom of God. He's inviting people not just to learn, but to unlearn every assumption they've ever made about life and about God. And he's saying, I want you to think deeper that, that what you've read in the Bible and the Old Testament isn't just a checklist of ways to earn favor with God. It's about the heart. And so all of chapter five, the last week, he, he would say, you've heard it, it was said, but I tell you, he's, he's giving them a deeper insight that God is always looking at the heart. That you can do the right thing, but if you do it for the wrong reason, well, God sees all of that. That everything you do flows out of your heart. That's why Solomon says, guard your heart with all that you have, because everything out of your life flows out of your heart. The decisions you make, they flow out of your heart. The hopes and dreams you have, they flow out of your heart. The anxieties and shame and regret you feel, you store that in your heart. What happens in your heart all the time is what God sees with perfect clarity. And so we want to be careful. Jesus is going to start this a part of the sermon out by saying, be careful that we don't do what we do for people around us to clap and say, you're amazing. No, make sure that the audience that sees what you do is the audience of one, God himself. And so he's going to talk about the practices of a person who wants to live in the kingdom. What does it mean to give, to be a generous person? What does it mean to pray, to connect with God as we speak to him? What does it mean for us to fast? These practices that aren't just outer actions, but that are also inward motivations. And so here we go. Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. Jesus says this, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others, to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Jesus is saying, be careful. Be careful that when you pray, that when you give, that when you fast, that you're not doing it to be seen by other people. He's using an example of, of the Pharisees and the leaders who, when they would give generously, they would they would sort of attract a crowd. They'd get someone to blow a trumpet. They'd make a big announcement. I am now giving $200 to help this poor widow. And people would go, wow, that guy is so generous, so amazing. Jesus says, be, be, be careful. The wrong people are clapping. You're doing this for the wrong audience. God wants to see you be generous and give, but do it in a way that doesn't draw attention to yourself. And so he wants to reward you. Now, that doesn't mean we're never supposed to give publicly or never supposed to pray publicly, or never supposed to fast publicly, because Jesus says in Matthew 5 that people will see your good works and they'll give glory to God in heaven, that you are the light of the world, that your good should be done in front of other people, but your good should not be done to be seen by other people. Jesus is looking at the why you do what you do, and he says, be careful not to do something, and here's the phrase, to be seen. Again, we see many public examples of, of, of generosity and giving. Even in the book of Acts chapter 4, the last part of the chapter, there's a man named Barnabas who sells a piece of property and gives all the proceeds of that pop property, lays it at the disciples' feet, and it's a very public act, and it's celebrated, and it spurs on all this generosity in the early church. It's not wrong to give publicly. It's why are you doing this in front of people? Are you doing it for applause are you doing it to build up and encourage the people around you? So it's not just the action, it's the motivation that matters. Now, if you're new to Christianity, again, you, you might be asking the question, okay, Doug, let me get this straight. There, 
You're telling me there's some people that pray just to draw attention uh, to, the, to themselves? That, that's kind of weird. Or people that would give just so people would look at them. And maybe you just... Maybe you just came out of the world and you're like, well, people do that in the world. You know, I know they post things on social media and I, I know they make it about them because they want to make money. But when you're a Christian, I, I thought, you know, all of a sudden that, that all that transfers toward God. And, and, and sometimes, if we're not careful, our need for affirmation competes with our desire to have a devotion to God. Because think about it. Why, why do you post the best picture of yourself on social media? You know, there's 10 pictures of you and there's a whole bunch of people in the pictures, you pick the picture where you look best. You don't care about anybody else. You just care about how you look. You don't care if their eyes are closed. You don't care if they're looking away. You look really good in photo number three. That's the one you post because, frankly, it's, it's all about you. It's all about me. That's how we are. This is the human condition. It's why maybe you really wanted someone to notice that new pair of shoes you had on because, well, they're new and they look good and that new piece of jewelry, that new, that new dress you wore, that, that new car you just drove into the parking lot, that, well, you want people to notice you. See, this is the human desire to be seen, to be affirmed, to be approved of, and, and if we're not careful, we can transfer all those things of the world onto our relationship with God and not even know that we're doing it. And Jesus is saying, you're not tricking God when you do that. You're not pretending, and he's like, oh, and the danger of, of of sort of being this actor spiritually is that you sort of think it's working, that, that God's actually impressed with you or like, wow, the, Doug's amazing or this person's amazing and just like, no, he's not like that. He, he wants to see you do these things in secret because he's looking at your heart. Now, I remember the first time I experienced this as a Christian. I was working on a construction site and uh, I was given the job to move a pile of dirt, a massive pile of dirt from here so like, uh, you know, 100 yards away over here, and the owner of the construction site was too cheap to rent a bobcat to move it, so he hired a college kid for like $8 an hour, because back in the day, that's what you made. And so all day, I had a shovel and a wheelbarrow to move dirt from here to here. And at the beginning of the day, I was working fairly hard, and then I got more and more and more tired as the day went on. But around lunchtime, when the boss came around, something miraculous happened. I got a surge of energy, and when the boss was around, I was like going so fast, and, and, and he was so impressed with how hard I was working. And then he left, and I slowed down again. <laughs> and I remember a verse that someone had shared with me Colossians 3.23, says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. Not like you're working for your boss, but like you're working for God because he's the one who's going to give you the reward in the end. It's your, he's the one you're actually serving. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. It's like I just pretended like God wasn't even there. I just pretended like the most important person in the room was the guy who was looking at me so I could get approval for myself. And I realized all those things I'd done as a non-Christian, I just transferred now as a Christian and hadn't even thought twice about it. And Jesus says, be careful not to do things just to be seen because you can trick yourself to think you're actually fooling God. And, and then he says, not just in the way that you give, but in the way that you pray. Look at verse five. And when you pray... Do not be like the hypocrites who love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. There's the phrase again, to be seen. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Now again, Jesus is telling this sermon to the very, very common people. You could say these people maybe weren't necessarily religious, and he's comparing them to the, the spiritual elite of the community. They're called the Pharisees. I mean, there was a saying in Jesus' day that if only two people would make it to heaven, it would be a scribe and a Pharisee. This whole caste system of this elite group of religious people who had turned the law into a stairway to heaven. 
who would turn all these practices of giving and serving and praying and fasting into this sort of hierarchy where they were the spiritually superior ones. And Jesus is, is challenging their religious system. He's saying, listen, you know, at the three times a day where a Jewish person would pray at nine and at noon and at three o'clock, you, you should be careful that you're not just praying to attract a crowd. You see, these Pharisees, they would walk through the street and well, they would know about the time of noon. It would just so happen that they would be right on the main intersection in Jerusalem. It would just so happen that they would begin to pray this eloquent prayer. It would just so happen that a crowd would start to gather and people would be like, man, that guy must be really close with God. That guy must be so righteous. That was the most amazing prayer I'd ever heard. And people would be like, that guy is amazing. And Jesus would say, the wrong audience is clapping. There's only one audience that matters when you pray. It's your Father who is unseen, your Father who is in heaven. So, so be very careful not to pray to be seen. Again, it's not wrong to pray publicly. Jesus prayed publicly. The early church prayed publicly. But to pray to be seen, well, that motivation is wrong. And he, he uses a phrase about these religious leaders, these people who feel superior. He calls them hypocrites. This is one of Jesus' favorite words for people who are like this. Now, hip hypocrite is not a Jewish word. It's a Greek word. It's a Greek word for actor. You see, back in the day, the, the Greeks would have these theaters all throughout the ancient world. And the actor would come and they'd put on their mask and they'd play one part and they'd go back and they'd put on another mask and they'd play the part. And a good Pharisee, a good religious person would never go to a Greek play because the Greek plays were very pagan and very sensual. And Jesus picks this word on purpose and says, you know, you guys, you guys are the actors. You know that play you would never go to? You're actually just like that. You are the show, but God is not clapping because you're not fooling him at all. You are pretending to be someone you are not. Now think about what an actor is. An actor steps into a role, and the better that actor or actress plays that role, the more people clap. The, the more you are the person or appear to be the person that you're not, well, that's when you win something called an Academy Award. The Academy Award goes to, and Jesus says, the worst thing that could happen in your relationship with God is for you to be a spiritual performer who wins an Academy Award because you'll be farther away from God than you could ever imagine. You see, the Pharisees, they would love to attract attention to themselves. And when you attract attention to yourself, you take attention away from God. And we, we as the people of God now, 2,000 years later, we want to be cautious. Am I ever drawing attention to myself when I pray, when I give, so that people don't look at God, they look at me. So I want you to think about the, the first time that someone asked you to pray out loud. Anybody remember the first time someone asked you to pray out loud? And you're sort of freaking out a little bit because for me, I was like a brand new Christian. I think we were maybe like a, a dinner table or something, and someone's like, Doug, would you like to say the blessing? Mm. <clears throat> my mouth got really dry, and my heart started beating, and my hands were sweaty, and, and, I, and, and I'm like, uh, okay, um, God, thank you for this food and all our friends, and, and bring peace to the world. Amen. And you know, the whole time I was praying, I wasn't thinking at all about God. I was thinking, what am I saying? What am I saying? This is so stupid. These people are probably judging me. I don't know what I'm saying. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't, I don't, I don't know how to pray. The whole prayer was just me thinking about myself. It was that self-conscious thing. Anybody? I'm the only person? You, you don't, don't want me to hang out here all by myself. Okay, all right. So, so and, and, and what could happen is, after you learn the language of prayer about talking to God, you can actually get really good at praying. I mean, some of you are really good at praying. Like, you can drop in scripture in the middle of your prayer to the God who was able to do abundantly, exceedingly above what we can ask or imagine. And you, and you can go high, you can go low, you can go fast, you can go slow. You know all the names of God, and you can string it out in a whole prayer. You can even put a song in there. And when you're done praying, people are like, whoa. 
that was amazing. And Jesus says, be careful. Because all the attention just went from him to you. And you know, who was the first one who did that? His, his name was Lucifer. He was an angel in heaven. He was one of the chief cherubs. And somehow he sort of lost his way. Why is everyone looking at God? I want people to look at me. Why, why can't I sit in his seat? Why can't people be in awe of me? I want people to look at me. And he leads a rebellion in heaven. And he's brought about a rebellion in earth. And well, here, here's what the Bible says about Satan today. Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. The word masquerade, same, same idea as an actor. He, he's not going to present himself as he really is. He hides his true self. So if you think, oh, I would never give way to a temptation from the devil, that may be because you imagine him showing up in a red suit with horns and a pitchfork and offering you an apple. But that's not how he appears. He appears as that woman who gives you a second look, and it feels so good. He appears as that guy who makes these promises to you. And for the first time, you start to believe that that could be true for you. He appears to you in this business opportunity that's not exactly illegal, though it may be unethical. He appears to you in a juicy morsel of gossip about someone that you don't like so much. And you lean in because you love to hear when she stumbles and falls. You see, that's how he appears. He hides his true self. And Jesus is saying, no, when you pray, the one thing you don't want to do is to hide your true self. But well, we are the sons and daughters of Adam and Eve. And when they sinned, what was the first thing they did? They, they hid. And so Jesus is saying, listen, when you pray, the one thing you don't want to do is pretend. The one thing you don't want to do is hide. And so if you pray... Verse six, I want you to go into your room. Now that word is a Greek word. I want to give you the word. The word is tameon. Everyone say tameon. Tameon is the most private place in your house. In the ancient world, in the Middle East, you, you'd go not, not just into the bedroom, but there was this usually inner place where you would keep your safe, all your treasures, all your valuables. There's no windows there. It's the most secure place in the middle of your house. And here's the thing about that room where Jesus says, if you're gonna pray, go there. This is a place where no one can see you and where you can't see anybody else. And Jesus says, if you learn to pray in that place, you won't be thinking about the perfect words to say. You won't be feeling insecure about yourself. You won't be wondering, are people impressed with me or not? It'll just be you and your father. And he'll be listening to you in secret. And see what happens in that room, in that secret room, that prayer room, is you begin to invite him to shape your heart. God, I want to love what you love and hate what you hate, and I want your spirit to change me. And as you spend time alone where you're not pretending, it's the audience of one, and you're learning how to pray, you're asked questions, you're struggling with doubt, you're dealing with all that stuff. In that private place, God will begin to shape your heart until you forget yourself. You become self-forgetful. And you spend enough time alone with God, you can actually take that tame on that prayer and with you wherever you go. You can take it to work with you. You can take it on I-95 with you, and when someone cuts you off, you have this reservoir of peace, and you can say, bless you, my child. Go in peace <laughs> and the grace of God. And you can take it to work, and all the chaos and confusion of work. Listen, when I was a brand new Christian, one of my Tameon places was my car. My car had tinted windows, and I would pull up uh, to my first job uh, after college, and even at college, and n I would sit in my car, and, and I would know that I'm about to walk into a place where most people aren't Christians. I'm about to walk into a place that's full of temptation and, 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 and moments where my faith is going to be tested. I'm going to have people who are going to make fun of me today, and I, I love the respect of other people. So when I get disrespected or someone makes fun of me, it bothers me. Lord, help me to be okay if I'm persecuted, help me to be okay if I'm left out, help me to be okay. 
if people talk about me behind my back. Help me to be okay if, if someone's doing something unethical and I walk away. Help me to be okay with all those things that I need your strength. I don't have enough strength. And I need your wisdom. I don't always know what to do. Lord, help me to honor you and speak for you today. And it's amazing. Just two or three minutes in your car before you walk into that difficult space that God would meet with me that he would give me courage and wisdom of grace, not to live a perfect life, but to know that he was the audience of one, that what he saw in my mind and in my heart mattered more than what anyone else thought or saw. Jesus says, so when you pray, go into that private place. Do you have a place like that? A Timaeon. See, Jesus invites us to go there every day before you go to a counselor or a therapist, before you call a pastor for the problem, you have a chance to go in the very presence of the God of the universe who provides everything you need, who can heal any of your diseases, who is your victory over your life and wants to speak blessing over your life. He says, in that secret place, God will reward you. How many of you want to experience the reward of God in your life, right? We all want to experience the blessing of God. Jesus, Jesus invites us, go into that secret place and your father who sees you in secret will reward you in that secret place. And, and then Jesus says, and, and, and I also want to teach you how to pray. And so, and so he's going to give the disciples what we call the Lord's Prayer. It's not just here in the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 6. It's also in Luke chapter 11. And in Luke 11, the disciples ask Jesus a question before he teaches them the prayer. They say, Jesus, teach us how to pray. So if you're here today and you're like, uh, I'm not really good at praying. I don't really know any of the words to say. Then, then you're in a good place because you can learn how to pray. The disciples didn't know how to pray at all. And Jesus says, I'm going to teach you how to pray. He gives them a simple prayer. He says, this is how you should pray. He doesn't say this is what you should pray. He's given it as a structure, as a way to talk to God and have a relationship with God. Because he says, you don't want to be the type of person who just says a rote prayer like vain babblings. He says, the pagans do that. No, he says, you want to talk to your father. And so sometimes we can even take this prayer and make it a vain babbling. Maybe you grew up in a religious tradition where you, you, you feel like you've, you've sinned and you feel that sense of conviction, so you go talk to a priest or someone and they say, go say five Our Fathers. And so you're like, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, earth is in heaven, given the day, daily bread, and five, five times. And that's not what Jesus intended. He's intending a relationship, not just a rote prayer that you say over and over again. And it, the length of the prayer, it's only four or five sentences long. It's not a long prayer. The, the strength of your prayer has nothing to do with the length of your prayer. It has to do with bringing your real self in front of the real God and watching what happens. Just the same way you build a relationship with a person, you build a relationship with God. You learn to communicate. And so Jesus gives this prayer. Verse nine. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. This very simple prayer. Notice it doesn't start with, God, I'm broke. I need money. God, this person, I can't stand them. Get them and help me with all these issues in my life. No, 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 no. Before you start going off on all the stuff that you're anxious about or dreaming about or in need about, think about who you're speaking to. Who am I addressing? Jesus says, pray our Father in heaven. Hallowed be your name. You're establishing his presence in the room, in the secret place. This is who I'm talking to. It's not no ordinary person. Like, hey, bro, what's up? How we doing? You're speaking to the God of the universe, and he's listening to you. Here's what Martin Lloyd-Jones says about establishing the presence and power of God in the room. He says, I am now entering into the audience chamber of that God, the almighty the absolute, the eternal and great God with all his power and his might and majesty, that God who is a consuming fire, that God who is light and in whom is no darkness at all, that utter 
absolute holy God. That is what I am doing. This should give us a moment of pause because this holy, almighty God, the creator of heaven and earth, who knows everything about you and who gave his son Jesus to die for you, he's attentive to you. And the first word that Jesus says you can use to describe him is father. Now, father implies there's a relationship going on here. And if you didn't have a good father, that may be like a trigger for you, but Jesus is describing the perfect father, the father who knows you and loves you and is for you and loves you so much, he would give himself up for you. This is who we speak with when we come to prayer. And then the next part of the phrase or prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come. What a prayer, what a powerful prayer. God, your kingdom come. Jesus knows what it's like to be in heaven and he knows the Father and he's saying, as it is in heaven, I know what it's like in heaven and what you're experiencing on earth and what's happening in heaven, there's a difference here and in the gap, you pray. So if you watch the news and you're like, man, Washington, D.C. is a train wreck, it's a dumpster fire, then instead of wringing your hands and watching more cable news, what if you pray, God, I pray your will be done in Washington, D.C., as it is in heaven. Come on, somebody. We need more people praying for our country, right? It's not just our country, though. It could be our church. God, make us a united church. The world is so divisive right now. There's so much talk about us against them, but in the church, well, there's a beautiful, powerful prayer that we would be a united church. God, I pray that there would be a spirit of unity in this church like it is in heaven. In, in our family. God, our family, we're not always on the same page. We don't always love and serve each other. Sometimes there's arguments and sometimes it's a, a us against them. And God, your will be done in my family as it is in heaven, in my marriage as it is in heaven, in my job as it is in heaven, inviting God's presence into the gap between heaven and earth. And there's one thing that stands in the way. God's will happening out there. And that's that we fight God's kingdom coming in here. What do I mean? The biggest obstacle to God's kingdom out there coming is God's kingdom coming in us, his followers, because Jesus calls us the light of the world, but sometimes we don't let the light in. Sometimes we don't allow it in because, I don't know if you know this or not, but there's an unholy trinity that many of us worship. Me, myself, and I. We live in the me generation. We were raised to think about what we think and what we feel, and we find our identity. We define our future. We follow our own hearts. We, we shape our own path. We live however we want, how we want to express our sexuality, how we want to spend our money, how we want to pursue our dreams, how we want to live our lives. I did it my way. Our world continually preaches that this message, it's all about me. I am always on my mind. The biggest obstacle to the kingdom of God in our lives is the person we see in the mirror every single day. And so maybe one of the most powerful prayers that you can pray every day is, God, your kingdom come in me as it is in heaven. And maybe this phrase will come to our minds, it's not about me, it's about you. It's not about what I want, it's about what you want. It's not about my kingdom, it's about your kingdom. You have a kingdom that wants to come and I have a kingdom that wants to stay and I pray I could surrender and yield to you in that private place. That's one of the reasons why posture is so important. You see, in the private place, there may be moments of posture where you do this. Your body can train your soul to remind you that you are not the king, that he is the king. And the posture of prayer, when you're about to make a big decision of open hand, says, God, I'm not in control of decisions, so I surrender it to you. You see, there are ways we can train ourselves to practice our righteousness in the private place that will begin to shape our hearts to be like God's heart. So when we say, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, and, and, and maybe your mind is going to things that, 
well, you know, yeah, I know there's some people, they, 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 wanna, they wanna sin however they want and still ask God to bless them, but often our kingdom is way more subtle than that. So I'll give you a quick example. Like, what time did you get to church today? Now, some of you were later, like, oh, did he see me coming late? No, I didn't see you coming late. <laughs> I mean, not this week, but, but, but every week, because I know the Starbucks line was long, and, and you, wanted to, you hit the snooze button once or twice, and you got to get ready for a party tonight. And, and some of you don't even know, actually, before, before I preach, there's actually worship. People are, we're worshiping together. We're singing praise to God because we're practicing for our future to worship God forever, right? So, and, and you missed all that because it doesn't fit precisely in your schedule. And, and here's the thing. If, if you had a ticket to the Super Bowl, what time would you get there? Ah, I see. So I think about this, right? If they were giving away free stuff at Macy's, what time would you get there? And you start to realize that you show up for what's important to you. And so if you're repetitively late for the gathering of God's people, or you've been watching online, not because you have to, because it's just easier for you, and you haven't been in the presence of God's people, you haven't taken communion, you've just missed it. It's because you, your kingdom sometimes is, is more important than God's kingdom. Like, how many times has your, has your phone gone off since you've been in service? Because you know there's a way to put it on silent and say, I'm gonna howl this space for the next hour or so and just give God my undivided attention. But that, that, that's, a, that's a choice that you make. Or, or how about this? What time are, do you leave church? You know, right at the end when we, when we make a call for people that, that don't know Jesus to come to know Jesus, and, you, and you're like, man, if I can beat the crowd, I can, I can save five minutes in the parking lot. I can, get, I can be first in the line of the grill. And so you don't even think about the fact that you're, you're, you're walking out right when someone's about to come forward, and all of a sudden they, they step back because you distracted them in the most important moment of their life because it, it was all about you in that moment. And you start to realize when you think deeply about this, we all do this all the time. And so when we say, God, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, I hope we don't think first about all the brokenness out there, but we think about the deep brokenness in here and we invite God to say, God, come inside and reshape me. I want all of your kingdom and all of me. I want to love like you love. I want to serve like you serve. I want to see what you see because this is how God wants to shape our hearts. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then he says, give us today our daily bread. Think about how simple of a prayer that is. God, give me food today. That means no prayer is too small for God. And notice he says daily bread, which means, God, I'm dependent on you way more than I believe. You could have plenty of money in the bank. You could have a retirement plan. You could have all of the stuff. But you know what? The breath you just took was a gift of God. And he doesn't owe you another one. And God could create a financial crisis where all that you save would just evaporate. It happens all the time all over the world, but in America, somehow we think it would never happen here. And so we have this sort of sense like, I'll call on God if I need him. But he says, no. If you learn to pray, give us today our daily bread. You're the one who gives me bread. You're the one who gives me breath. You are Jehovah Jireh. You are my provider. So I'm not going to be anxious and I'm not going to be self-righteous. I'm just going to live in dependence. Then you connect with the heart of the Father. And then he says, and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Which means in the quiet place, in the secret place, we learn not just to receive the forgiveness of God, but to extend the forgiveness of God to someone else. Now, I know that when someone else hurts you or betrays you or manipulates you, that's, that's a hard thing to say, I forgive them. But Jesus reminds us, if we spend time in the presence of God thinking of all he'd forgiven us for, that our sin put Jesus on the cross. Our sin led to the nail being driven in his hands and his feet and the spear going inside. That was, that was on me. He took my sin debt on him. Jesus, if you did all that for me, then I can do that for that person who hurt me. So as I receive your forgiveness, let it flow through me to that person. And the longer we delay that process, the harder it is to forgive and the greater the walls come up. And so Jesus says this in, in verse 14, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly father will also forgive you but if you do not forgive others their sins, your father will not forgive your sins. 
And you see this kingdom connection between being forgiven by God and forgiving others, and this becomes part of a daily prayer. If every day you forgave the person who hurt you, who offended you, who spoke about you, if you did that every day and you practiced it, it would become part of, of life in the kingdom of God, and you would be so free, so much more free than you've ever been, and Jesus invites us to that freedom in the prayer room. And then he says, and leave me not into temptation, but deliver me from the evil one. There is an evil one. There's an evil one who says, it should be all about you because you deserve. And you are unique, so not everything that God says about you applies to you. You have this exception and that exception because, well, he'll understand in the end, so you do you. And... The more we listen to that voice, the more we stray away from what God has for us. And so Jesus wants us to be cognizant. There is an evil one, and he is coming to deceive us with ideologies and thoughts that are about us and making all of our life about us. And he invites us to pray a prayer that will shape our hearts and minds in the kingdom of God. And then verse 16, he talks about fasting, just like he talked about praying and giving. And when you fast... Do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Whether you give or pray or fast, Jesus says, Make sure you're doing it for the audience of one. And so now we're going to practice the Lord's Prayer. We're actually going to do something crazy. We're going to pray in church. All right? I know that sounds crazy. But we're not going to pray out loud. We're not going to draw attention to ourselves. I'm just going to put each sentence or each phrase of the Lord's Prayer and just give you a prompt. And then you're going to sit in your seats and you're just going to talk to God. And it might feel very uncomfortable for the first few moments. But, but you might feel a connection, a moment where you, you sense his presence, his reality in and around your life. And so we're going to take a moment and we're going to pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Let's take a moment and let's talk to our Father. Who am I praying to? God who is holy, the one who created heaven and earth, the one who sent his son Jesus to die in our place, the one who allows us to call him Abba, Daddy, the one who will never leave us or forsake us, the one who wants a relationship with us. Take a moment right now and talk to your father. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Take a moment and bow your knee to his kingdom. Surrender your will. You can even say, God, your kingdom is better than my kingdom. You can acknowledge that you are not the main character of the story, that it's not about you, it's about him. And invite him into your family, your marriage, your job, your church, your city, your country, your world. And ask him to bring revival and awakening first to you 
and then to the church. Talk to him right now. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Take a moment and, and come to God poor. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of God. We come to God in need physically, emotionally, spiritually. Acknowledging that he provides all we need every day like manna. That he is Jehovah Jireh, our provider. He is Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals. And that right now he's listening to your prayer. Whatever you need, bring it to him now. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Maybe there's a person who hurt you. They betrayed you. They used you. They lied to you. They manipulated you. And you feel stuck. Angry, bitter, miserable. You're just not free. And right now you can say to God, everything you want to say to them, say, God, help me to forgive. And you put their name in the blank. And you trust God that as he's freely forgiven you, he can give you the strength to free them and forgive them. Take that time right now. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Think about a temptation that you're facing right now. Maybe a, a sin that's stronger than you. You might even call it a bondage. And that sin is stronger than you, but it's not stronger than God. He is Jehovah Nisi, the God who is our victory. And if you just say, God, deliver me rescue me. He can answer that prayer and he can set you free. Take a moment and talk to your father. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. And all of God's people said, amen.